Now China's a country that polarizes people's opinions, mine included. I'll be the first to correct someone that is unfairly criticizing the country, and the first to point out when overly optimistic visions of China's future are just plain wrong. I've seen China in its golden years, and I've seen a country where the top-heavy policies are starting to tear at the seams. The first thing that China is seemingly doing correct is growth and development. I have to admit, when I would leave China to visit my hometown once every couple years around 2008 to 2012, it was just embarrassing to see that not only did nothing change in my hometown, but the few businesses and attractions that were just managing to keep afloat were shutting down. The once passable city center was now more or less boarded up. The mall, destitute and abandoned. People were leaving in droves to go south for better jobs, and it really looked like local politics and economic policies were failing in the town. Not only small towns like my own were disappointing though, I would fly into JFK Airport in New York City and just feel like I was stuck somewhere in the 70s in terms of the tech and attitude in the workforce. Stepping out of the cab into New York City, it wasn't dirty per se, but everything just felt old. Yeah, old is a good word for it. Yeah, the charm was always there. I love New York, and it's always had a special place in my heart, but I just couldn't shake the feeling of it not going places. Trying to get home was a nightmare. There was only a couple buses for a day for over 50 bucks just to make a 100 mile journey. I'd have to take a $52 taxi ride from the airport to the bus station as well. Meanwhile, flying back to China, I would look out the window of my plane and I'd see the magnificent buildings springing up from the ground like bamboo shoots after a good rainstorm. I'd hop off the plane and be able to take a direct bus that only cost $7 to my small city of 3 million people in a matter of minutes. Because straight from the airport, the buses left every 15 minutes. But if I want to splurge a bit, I could just take the high-speed rail. Yeah, even my tiny little no-name city had a high-speed rail line. Keep in mind, this is one of the least important cities in the province, so it's not like I was going to DC from New York City. It was more like going to my hometown from New York City. After getting off the bus, it cost me $2 in taxi fares to go straight to my house. And guess what? Even back in 2013, I was paying for everything with my phone. On the bus from New York City to my hometown, I'd watch the swaths of forest go by on my journey. I couldn't help but shake the fact that when I got home, I'd be stuck there. The near shop was a 15 minute drive, and there was certainly no one that was going to deliver anything that I needed to my door. Flashback to my backwater apartment in no-name Chinese city, and I was having Oreos and beer delivered to me at any time of night. Not that I recommend that anyone order Oreos and beer at 1am, but I could, and that's what mattered. Pop downstairs any time of night and I could sit roadside and eat and drink to my heart's content. Make friends with curious locals and spend little to nothing. How's $5 for some beers and barbecue sound? Now convenience is aside, life in China compared to the US felt relaxed. Anything goes. The rules were more of a suggestion than anything. I ran my business cash or WeChat pay and clients would come to my informal office for English lessons. Word of mouth was enough for a 20-something year old like myself at the time to make a really nice profit and a ton of spare time to party, meet people, and pursue my hobbies like riding and building motorcycles to boot. Compare this to my prospects of working my way up slowly as a network admin or a code monkey in the States where I was still paying off student debt and life looked horrible at home. I watched myself move up financially, socially, and I really felt like the world was my oyster. I got married, I had my first child, and although the responsibilities as a parent started to take over, I still could go to my roof at night with my buddies, crack a beer, and watch the city around me explode with neon and development and hope. The train felt like it would never stop. I even expanded and started making videos full time, not to mention I had the freedom to go out on month long expeditions and film full on TV documentaries with little to no regulation on where I could go or what I could do. I could speak Chinese fluently, and I was finally able to pursue my dreams, riding motorcycles and filming amazing content with my best friends. Things however changed pretty drastically. The train and bus tickets that I mentioned now needed a Chinese ID to buy them, something I would never have. You can't become a citizen of China. You can't even get a green card. This meant being enslaved to my wife's help with really buying anything transport related. It was now illegal to put an American flag up next to the Chinese one at the entrance to my English training center, 
even though it symbolized cooperation. Police visits became a regular fixture in my life, and friends and family in the government were now telling me that I was constantly being monitored and followed, and I should be careful about posting anything online, or who I was associated with. And keep in mind, all of my content was fairly positive. Social media and non-Chinese websites were now blocked, and my little window to the outside world was now shut. My motorcycle business with my best friend shut down when the government decided that it wanted to reclaim the land for more ramshackle ghost towns for hungry real estate investors. No one was asked if this was okay. A big uptick of kidnappings in the neighborhood park started to become more prevalent, and with a child at home, the idea that I could lose my daughter to human traffickers really kept me up at night. Unrest at the nearby hospital down the road led to the murder of countless nurses, and drunken street violence at the barbecues was hard to avoid now. Police would arbitrarily threaten me with arrest, even coming to my door, because I had flown a drone over the building where I lived. They said there was a military base that was visible in the footage. Meanwhile, the exact same footage was posted on Chinese video sites by Chinese people with no pushback. Arbitrary enforcement of law when random government leaders would come to town meant that street side vendors were closed and shooed away with all their goods confiscated. All of the choice I had for restaurants on my local road would close and reopen with worse and worse quality food. I got sick a lot more than in the past, and with the ever-growing prevalence of gutter oil being used in the cooking and the fake alcohol even being sold in large supermarket chains, it wasn't a good time to be eating or drinking anything. The buildings I once fawned over started showing signs of abandonment, and those bamboo shoots springing up around me at an alarming rate turned out to be hollow shells and empty apartments, some of them nearly collapsing only after three years. Due to the advice of my Chinese family and friends, I bought my own apartment for my family. But the elevator collapsed twice in this shiny new building that had literally just been built, and massive cracks formed across the floors and walls. China also decided to randomly ban motorcycles, so every day involved a calculated route to avoid police barricades where they would snatch your keys and take your bike indiscriminately. This caused an insane explosion in car traffic, which made it frustrating to drive anywhere. You really had to time when you went out. Our next documentary, Conquering Northern China, focused on showing the positive adventures that China had to offer, and it led us to being searched and detained by the SWAT team, as well as the People's Liberation Army. Apparently, they don't like footage of camels. We were harassed and bullied out of towns, not allowed to stay at most hotels, followed, and we quickly realized that the vibe towards foreigners had changed. For the first time, I would be heckled almost weekly by locals who had been reading too much news about how China's problems are now the fault of foreigners. You're stealing our Chinese women! Go home, foreigner. I don't like Americans. Family members who once loved having me over started to blame me for political decisions abroad that they deemed as bad Western influence that was harming China. My fluency in Chinese had gone from a major asset to a sad realization that people's opinions about the outside world were souring. Foreigners were now corralled into an A, B, or C class system based on arbitrary standards and dictated what they could or couldn't do for work. The social credit system was being rolled out, which monitors your activity, what you do or say about the government, and pretty much all of your actions. And banners praising the current leader as well as tons of communist insignia started to be unveiled in every corner of the country. Cameras could now be found on every stoplight and street corner. All this new regulation, the clampdowns, the renewed xenophobia, even the growth seemed to be shifting from a tolerable inconvenience to a full-fledged, messy, bureaucratic nightmare. You see, China's always thrived on being a gray area in almost all walks of life. Capitalism had taken its tolls in many ways, but life was improving and even felt freer than the West in many, many ways, albeit no political expression or freedom of speech. Now churches are being dismantled, millions of ethnic minorities are being put into concentration camps and being told that they're Chinese but need to be re-educated, families torn apart, foreign entertainment opinions blocked and squashed, overstepping boundaries when it comes to free societies like you see in Hong Kong, military showmanship, threats, imprisonment, and doxing, huge smoke and mirror government projects like the Belt and Road Initiative have created a populace that doesn't dare speak out gives up what little freedom they had in the first place to do and say what they want. In many ways, China has effectively become a dystopian police state, and the wonderfully curious and upwards-looking people I once knew have become deeply affected by the one-party rule. 
clinging to order as their house of cards starts swaying with economic slowdown and other changes in the world around them. The open tap for dialogue with other people from other countries has effectively been shut off and they've created an army of soft power internet trolls and government initiative to try and prove to the world that it's not only us versus them, but that our system is best. You see, there's a bit of self-guilt involved. You might think, over these past 10 years I've changed. Maybe now I'm the one that's become sour. I'm the one that's become bitter. But when you look at your language experience, the people you know and love, the things around you, the place that you bought a house in, the place that you started a family in, Everything around you is shifting towards the negative. Everything around you is being clamped down on and tightened up. And people's freedom of expression and ideas that once almost flourished in the early years of me moving to China are now squashed. You realize that these past 10 years, you've started to understand actually how things are working. And not only that, how things are potentially going. And it doesn't feel good. Now when I go back home to my tiny little town in the forest, it all makes sense. And it feels fantastic. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, please consider supporting me on patreon.com slash 6 where you can see other bits of the shows. You can vote on topics and you can actually talk to me directly. And don't forget that every single Wednesday at 1 p.m. EST, you can watch another Lao 6 Click right here for another one. Don't forget every single Monday at 1 p.m. EST, you can watch ADB China. And just in time for a beer every single Friday, you can watch Serpents a Day every single Friday at 1 p.m. EST. And don't forget, very important, subscribe to our live show, ADB Podcast, every other Thursday. Thank you so much, Lowrunners, and I'll catch you on the next one.